So, community fans the world over got some pretty great news earlier this month. An untitled community movie is headed to NBC's streaming service Peacock. This is big. I'm excited as heck. But I'm not going to be speculating about the movie in this video. No, I think this news about the end of community provides the perfect occasion to do something I've wanted to do for a while with this channel, to go back to where it all started, and to take a closer look at the show's pilot. I hereby pronounce you a community. Oh, that's nice. In this video, then, we're going to talk about the story, the characters, the breakfast club, and the Dan Harmon factor. And this is going to be the start of a new series on this channel, a series of deep dives into the first episode of each community season. But we'll get into that a bit more at the video's end. For now, let's dive in. Season 1, Episode 1, then. Community. The Pilot. To start with, I want to take a brief look at this episode in isolation, to separate these 22 minutes from everything that followed, to appraise it on its own terms. And on its own terms, this is a very solid episode of television. Even if lots of it changed throughout the following episodes and seasons, the characterization of this core cast is razor sharp right out the gate. We see a lot more of Jeff's perspective here, so his is the character we get to know and understand most by the time the credits roll, but as soon as the surprise study group sequence begins and the rest of the Greendale 7 introduce themselves, we immediately get a crystal clear picture of who they are, and of the less than harmonious group dynamic that's likely to emerge. Children get pity, but not respect, and adults, they get respect, but they also get the back of their head grab and their face push through jukeboxes. Okay. On the other hand, we've got the Jeff Duncan stuff, the scenes which really propel the narrative forward. And this is a genuinely interesting story. Thematically, it's pretty rich. Jeff, who seems to be this totally amoral weasel, able to scurry away from any problem, any issue, gets caught in a situation with no easy exit. And the way he deals with this, or rather, the way he kind of can't deal with it without beginning to change? That's a home run for me. Self-sufficiency, lonerism, these are fine if you've got cheat codes, if you've got an ability to cut corners. But when that falls apart, well, fancy that. Community becomes necessary. It becomes more than just a lie spun to impress the blonde from Spanish class. When your pedestal, your head start, your leg up disappears, you fall right back down with the rest of us, and you realize that this togetherness is all you've got, is the only way you can stand a chance in the rat race. And I think that's an observation which rings equally true, whether that rat race is a community college or the world outside of one. So that's the pilot in isolation, considered apart from the monumental legacy of the show that followed. But we only get so much from an isolated approach. So I want to start thinking about the pilot with the show's future in mind. That's the main reason I wanted to make this video, actually, because I think there's far more continuity here between the pilot and the show's eventual form than has often been granted. The conventional wisdom around the community pilot is that the character stuff's pretty sharp, it's funny, its charm just about outweighs its cynicism, yada yada yada, but that the more conceptual, more meta sensibilities that the show would become known for are nowhere to be seen here. That the community pilot is content just being TV. That it's not really interested in questioning or playing with its own medium. An example of this sort of view is Captain Midnight's video on the community pilot, which suggests that community's wacky meta a future is hard to see here. The good captain notes there's references aplenty in the pilot, but no premonitions of the show's more conceptual side. There's nothing here that suggests just how crazy this would get later on. And look, I really like Captain Midnight, and I'm not even saying I disagree with his video more broadly, but I will say that this is an area where my take is sort of incompatible with his. Because to me, Community's pilot is already doing this, already displaying an early version of that proclivity towards homage, already telling its story through a pop cultural point of reference. Community went on to do a Star Wars, to do a Ken Burns documentary, and to do a Goodfellas. Here, in the pilot, it's doing a breakfast club. Sure, a lot of the pilot was apparently inspired by Dan Harmon's own life. His experiences taking a Spanish class in a community college, and making some unlikely 
unlikely friends along the way. But the choice to create in this pilot a crucible of friendship forming, set in a library, a situation where this diverse cast is brought together and pressure cooked into a real connected community across one day? I mean, I didn't go to school with Harmon, so I guess I can't say definitively that something like this never happened to the guy, but come on. That's, that's Breakfast Club. That's almost certainly where he lifted the general outline of this premise from. And yeah, in case any of you haven't seen the pilot in a hot minute, this isn't some spurious link I've come up with myself. Breakfast Club is openly referenced here, like a bunch. This is kind of like Breakfast Club, huh? We are in a library. It was a banner year at the Bender family. I got a carton of cigarettes. The old man grabbed me and said, Hey, smoke up, Johnny! No, Dad, what about you? Well, uh, that, that actually was from the Breakfast Club. The Breakfast Club homage is lampshaded, sure, but that act of lampshading doesn't nullify the fact that there is some sort of homage or reception here, and that it ends up having a pretty big impact on the pilot. That impact is what I want to move on to now, because I don't just want to point out a couple of superficial similarities here and say, like, hey, this thing is kind of like that thing. It's a reference. That means it's good and clever. No, I think the pilot's reception of that 80s classic goes a little deeper. I think that this pilot, and to some extent the show as a whole, is offering an answer of sorts to a question that people have been asking about The Breakfast Club ever since it first came out. What, if anything, remains of the links these detention buds have formed when school starts again on the Monday? The film itself seems to feel that this company will dissolve utterly once each member returns to his or her previous place in the school hierarchy. But the film itself is never quite certain, and this is a question that stayed with audiences throughout the years. And I'm not for one moment saying I dislike the approach that film took, I think it speaks powerfully to just how savage teenage social politics are, but I do like the way Community flippity flops that film's sentiment with the pilot's ending. The whole necessity of community thing we touched on earlier. Because the school here isn't just a backdrop, it's a school. Jeff now has to actually work to pass, and he can't do it by himself. In the pilot, then, perhaps unlike Breakfast Club, school isn't just detention, and abstracted ideas of cliques and hierarchies, or different lifestyles and backgrounds. School is classes, studying, tests, collaboration, or at least, since this is just the pilot, the foreknowledge of them. On a basic level, connection is needed. Otherwise, Jeff's screwed. And maybe the others are too, albeit in less visible ways. Maybe today, maybe at a community college somewhere near you, maybe the breakfast club, maybe a breakfast club would stay friends. Why not, right? And the ending's one thing, but for the rest of the episode, if we are to read the pilot through this Hughesian lens, Jeff, of course, takes the role of the vice principal, Vernon, the one responsible for putting this misfit found family in the library and keeping them there. And that kind of fits. While Jeff's our protagonist in this pilot, he is a bit of a scumbag. It's to Harmon's credit that the pilot is able to inject just enough pathos to keep Jeff just about in the audience's sympathy, despite the way he manipulated these people. If we are to read the pilot as, in part, a reception of The Breakfast Club, then this, the borderline villainy of Jeff Winger, surely exists again in part as a response to that earlier character. This curious balance of good and bad in Jeff is something the show returns to time and time again, and something which doesn't even come close to being resolved until the latter half of Community's run. That's one of the reasons I think this aspect of the pilot needs more recognition. The way that barely visible dimensions of that Breakfast Club reception do have real knock-on effects on the show community would grow into. And hey, maybe this is a bit of a reach. It's obviously not a total fit for a lot of reasons, but that's what I get from this. And I'm pretty sure most of it is intentional. And that's why I think that even in this very first episode, the seeds of Community's insane, conceptual, sometimes experimental future are clearly sown already. The last point I want to make about Community's first episode is that this was the first time that a mass audience had seen Dan Harmon's work, his particular identity. Harmon had been around at this point for like a decade, writing for projects, some of which found cult success, but the Community pilot was really the first time a wider audience had heard Harmon's distinctive voice. 
and it comes through so clearly. As the pilot, this is one of the most direct, unfiltered visions of Harmon's writing we'd see throughout the show's run. Being mostly community showrunner, Harmon always had a big hand in the show's production, but most of the time there were plenty of other writers, other voices in the mix after this point. This, though, is as near to unfiltered Harmon as we ever saw at Greendale. The little pop cultural potshots scattered throughout everyday life, which everyone gets and has an opinion on. We can sympathize with a pencil, we can forgive a shark, and we can give Ben Affleck an Academy Award for screenwriting. Big mistake. The baseline sense of annoyance at life's semi-meaningless social rituals. Not so good at the small talk. Yeah, I like big talk. What's your deal? That's not small talk. What's your deal and is God dead? The bitingly sharp one-liners. Are you familiar with the adage, cheaters never prosper? No. And if I wanted to learn something, I wouldn't have come to community college. This is all Harmon to a T. Even in smaller moments, there's hints of ideas which would go on to reoccur again and again in Harmon's work. The open fictionality of national myth. When you made that U-turn on the freeway and tried to order chalupas from the emergency call box, that your only real crime was loving America. Or the way everything always comes back to family. He's a US citizen, he's not a threat to national security or anything. A lot of people want to know that after they meet him because he has an angry energy. But not like angry at America, just angry at my mom for leaving him. That's something which always stands out to me whenever I come back to this pilot. How idiosyncratic it all feels. The dialogue, the story, the ideas. Take that Shark Week bit. The way profundity is located within the most banal, superficial trappings of modern culture. And the way that profundity is, just a moment later, undercut entirely. What about the look left speech? Made it up, that's what I do. I make things up and I got paid a lot of money to do it before I came to the school-shaped toilet. If you've seen the rest of this show, if you've seen Rick and Morty or Harmontown or any of the other countless projects Harmon's had a hand in, I'd wager moments like these and the pilot's wider sense of this uneasy balance between cynicism and meaning feel very familiar. These Harmonisms tend to come through most strongly in Jeff and Abed. Jeff's almost successful defense of his nihilistic outlook is, in a sense, the harbinger of a certain Rick Sanchez, and like that later character, feels at times like Harmon's trying to convince himself that there's some accuracy here more than he's trying to convince the audience. I discovered at a very early age that if I talk long enough, I could make anything right or wrong. So either I'm God or truth is relative. Abed's the other side of the coin, the eternal, compulsive believer in the power of fiction, of culture, of television. There's a sort of truth around us at all times, Abed seems to counter. All you have to do to access it is turn on a television set and tune in. I think it's been said before, though I'm not sure by who, that whenever we see these two characters interacting, it's like we're seeing one part of Harmon talking to another. And that rings true here, just as it does all the way into season six. That's another a key distinguishing element of community that carries through right till the end that's clearly visible here at the beginning. And that's the main takeaway I think I've got for you here. Yes, community grew immensely beyond the bounds set out by its pilot. Yes, even when considering season one alone, the second episode, Spanish 101, the first produced after NBC picked up this pilot, is probably more representative of the show we'd go on to have, introducing as it does the sets and characters which would round out this setting. But I think all the best bits of community, the weirdness, the wit, the intertextuality, it is all here, right from the start. Just maybe not in the exact same configuration that later episodes, later seasons would develop. I'm sure there's plenty of other videos or articles about this episode or on the first season that you've seen before, so I hope you've found this video's perspective to be somewhat unique. And yeah, as I suggested near the start of this video, I'm thinking this might be the first in a series of videos, jumping into the first episode of each community season and taking a look at what's changed, what hasn't, what these premieres set up for the rest of the season, and generally how community relaunched itself again and again. This is a show that changed and grew quite a lot during its run, and I think a series breaking down these premieres would be a good way to get to grips with community, one of my favorite shows of all time, in all its permutations. 
games, without going the perhaps more travelled route of a season-by-season -season retrospective. Don't expect instalments too often, though. Videos like this are kind of a labour of love on this channel, since they really don't pay the bills in a way that other topics do. Unless this video blows up, I'm thinking this'll be a series I come back to every couple of months. So yeah, subscribe down below if you don't want to miss the next one, and if any of you can come up with a witty name for this series, don't hesitate to drop that in the comments, cause I got nothing. Thanks so much for watching though, and a special shout out to all my Patreon supporters, especially Jonathan Francis Bond, Kevin Douglas, Ian Fifield, and Strange Folk. Subbing to this channel's not the hardest thing, it's true. Cause when someone makes banger content, there ain't nothing else to do. Subbing to Pillar of Garbage, subbing to POG.